Okay, so um, I'm going to uh, start then. Hi, my name is Richard Ullman. I'm with the Goddard Space Flight Center. And uh, I and, and uh, my development lead, Paige Jane, and my other uh, development member, uh, Wayne McCulloch, are going to talk with you about uh, our use of OODT uh, in our particular um, mission. And I wanted to, to sort of address some of the things that Dan said, because um, for, for us, at least at Goddard, we're first adopters of OODT. And um, so I wanted to, uh, to say what that meant. Uh, in technology and uh, diffusion theory, there's, a, there's something called a first adopter. And that's, those are people that are interested in using that technology for some strategic advantage. And they're, they're different from the technology enthusiast, which are people uh, who are interested in solving a problem for the problem's sake, and they're interested in that. I'm, I'm interested in using OODT to solve uh, other problems, not the OODT problem. And so I'm going to uh, explain to you what my problem set is, and then, um, then Peyush and uh, Wayne is go are, are going to ta talk to you about the, uh, the design and how OODT uh, fits into that. So, um, so the Joint Polar Satellite System, um, an overview. Uh, the Joint Polar Satellite System is a NASA and NOAA uh, uh, project. It's NOAA funded because it's the next generation of polar orbiting weather satellites. Um, uh, traditionally and, and currently, um, NASA builds the weather satellites, we launch them, and then we give them to NOAA, who, who runs them, in order to get the observations that they then use in the weather service to produce forecasts and, and so forth. So within the uh, mission architecture, it looks very much like uh, some of the things that Dan uh, showed you. Um, we're like other NASA missions in that way. But my area is this one little uh, box in the mission, which is called the, uh, the CalVal node. Um, the, the point of an observatory, uh, we call a satellite, in this case an observatory, is to get data uh, that is then used to create these products that Dan was talking about. And the question uh, for us in trying to use these products for uh, an operational uh, system like uh, NOAA needs to use these products to produce, uh, to know that they're good observations to make weather forecasts from, uh, is are they valid? And so that's quite called validation. They need to, the instruments and the, and the algorithms need to be calibrated so that we know the, uh, the goodness of that data and that, and that they're validated and to know that they are the correct uh, products. And so we are a, called a CalVal node. Uh, it's, a, it's a data system uh, in other NASA data systems are sometimes called a science computing facility, but in this case we're calling it a CalVal node. And this is another uh, diagram that shows us here is the calibration validation node. And in particular, uh, we named our node because we're, um, we're like other NASA and government uh, agencies, we got to have an acronym. So we came up with, with one called gravity. The, um, the um, let's see, I have to go up here so that I can know it. The government resource for algorithm verification, independent test and evaluation. Uh, we, we spent about a month coming up with that name. <laughs> um, and so we support the instrument calibration activities, the product validation activities, algorithm verification, algorithm product imp operational tuning, uh, product data quality support, that's monitoring that the products uh, are continuing to do what we validated that they do, um, and investigation of how to improve those algorithms over time. Um, and so when we set up this, this computer system, we wanted to do uh, both of the, the uh, prevailing paradigms. One is bring the computer to the data we have uh, with the JPSS system uh, observatory produces about uh, four terabytes of data a day. Uh, it's very expensive to move that data around. So we, we bring the data into our uh, gravity CalVal node. We keep, um, 34 days of that data, 
for the, the investigators to look at and, and to run trending and so forth on it. The 34 days is a magic number for us because the, our satellite, a polar orbiting satellite, has a repeat track of, of 17 days. So we have two repeat tracks. And a repeat track means that we're following the, the exact same line, tracing the same line over the surface of the Earth. Uh, that happens every 17 days. It's sort of like a spirograph. We go around and, you know, we get the same spot every 17 days. Um, we do see the whole world every day, but we see uh, the exact same, same places uh, 17 days. Um, and the other is uh, bring the data to the computer. So we, we also have a distribution function where we send the data to uh, other systems within uh, NASA or NOAA that do, do other analysis. Um, we're also what's called a Class C system under the NASA standards, uh, which means that we're, uh, we're, we support uh, mission, mission critical activities, but we're not, uh, well, we're not Class A or B. Class A is, is uh, space shuttle, you know, human place, uh, spacecraft, uh, or human life dependent. We're not that. We're Class C, and that's... Uh, so what is our design philosophy? First, we have to follow our NASA standards, and then we wanted to go off out on a limb and use open source, but not just use open source, but participate in open source, which is um, a challenge for, for an agency. Uh, and so as part of that, we intend to release components that we, we build back into the, uh, the OODT uh, ecosystem, uh, the way that, that Dan was, was describing. And, um, and so that's why we're here today. So this is what, what the gravity system is. Um, it's a little difficult to uh, point to from here, but um, maybe I'll do it this way. Does this work? No, it doesn't. Um, okay, so what we do is we have uh, data that comes, IDP, IDPS is where our uh, data products come from. That's the production system. They're ingested into the system, and we have correlative data. Those are other, other data that we want to compare this data to. We ingest it. We put it into an inventory. We do various processes on it, um, uh, workflow manager and so forth. We have something special here that I'll talk about in a minute called the algorithm development area. And we have this, which is called an uh, investigator computing facility. Those are areas that we do investigation on the data. And then uh, I'm also responsible for putting out a portal for our science investigators to, um, to collaborate on. So, <laughs> and uh, LCF is our local computing facilities. Those are, uh, they're called local, but they're actually external to us. Uh, those are the facilities that exist at other, uh, at the scientists' local uh, workstations and so forth. Uh, this is our external uh, archive uh, that is run by uh, NOAA. That's the enterprise archive rather than our own inventory. So. This slide just says what this is, and so for in terms of a vision of what we do, um, the easiest one is uh, the I. Uh, oh, it's not. I'm going to talk about the one that's closest to the uh, um, to the OODT sort of framework, a production engine. It's called an investigator processing system, is what we called it. Uh, it's a term that that is used often within NASA, the uh, science investigator processing system. Uh, the idea is that an investigator thinks of something that they want to um, want to execute on a regular basis. They create a piece of software, which we call a product generation executable, um, and they in integrate it into the into our system. That we then, when we get data, we run it according to a workflow, and the result goes back to the to the investigator in the end. This is the slide I thought that I was going to talk to at first. This is the investigator computing facility, and that's just a uh, general purpose computing facility that we host for the, our scientists. But the point is that we have this, this 34 day data store. Um, it's a lot of data, uh, it's 34 times, times four terabytes is, is a lot of data. And so we, rather than send it all to their workstation, we, we are, uh, the workstation is a window into this computing environment where we've got uh, data center CPUs, um, a bunch of um, uh, Xenon processors running uh, Red Hat Enterprise. 
Uh, they can see things on the portal, and they're running these, these programs uh, written in IDL or MATLAB or, or their own custom programs, uh, and they can share it among uh, their other investigators. Um, a third thing that we do is something called the algorithm development area. Um, this vision says that, the, uh, and the algorithm development area is a copy of, uh, it's a sandbox copy of our production environment that is the official IDPS. That's the, the thing that creates the products on the the day-to-day -day basis. And so when we create a new algorithm or a new uh, product, uh, we want to test out that that algorithm works in something like the production environment before we promote it into production. And so the, this test bed is available to us to, to do that. So um, we have the, the uh, user who, who runs in the algorithm development area. Uh, it turns out that, that our uh, production environment for these products is uh, AIX based uh, on power architecture. So we've got a, a cluster that is uh, Power 7 uh, chips uh, running AIX, and we can uh, test out, uh, do unit tests of our uh, software that way. And then we have um, the case where we are fixing a problem. Uh, data comes from our, our um, from our system, when we're doing our validation uh, process, we will find that there are errors, and the, the scientists will, will need to fix those errors, those, we call those discrepancies. So they fix a discrepancy, that's a bug, there's a bug report, they fix the software. Uh, there's a bunch of meetings, and we decide that it's time to, to create an algorithm change. We uh, create a package that proves that test case, and we do unit uh, test tests on it, uh, we inspect the result, and the algorithm change package then goes up into the operational system where we do uh, system end-to-end -end testing to, to assure that it, that it works in the, in the uh, system. So I'm about to get off the, uh, the stage, but I want to, to emphasize within, our, within the, our overall architecture, the rest of the uh, discussion is going to be talking about these uh, areas the ingest, inventory processing, and to, to some extent the, uh, the data access and distribution, but um, uh, most of the OODT components that we're using are in this stage here. So um, with that, I'm going to introduce my colleague, Piyush Jade, and tell you about um, our gravity requirements and design. Thank you. So, um, so we'll uh, here talk about IPS um, uh, design, which is one of the main components of gravity. So, um, uh, these are the driving requirements for um, for IPS, where gravity shall be able to um, ingest about five terabytes of data uh, per day. Um, users should be able to upload data onto our system. Um, operators, uh, users should be able to classify data, software documentation as uh, proprietary or ITAR for access control. Um, uh, we should be able to uh, have uh, searchable metadata parameters that uh, users can search on and download data. Um, uh, also, uh, Gravity should be able to uh, uh, run these automatic, uh, automated processes um, and also, um, one of the last, uh, last, things he, last thing here is the um, once we're storing all this data, so there is uh, automatic removal of uh, data uh, once uh, retention time is, uh, um, is achieved. So um, at a high level, uh, these are the major functions that we want to support or we support. Um, we get data from various uh, data sources onto our landing zone. Then we have ingest process, which uh, gets the data from the landing zone, puts the metadata information in the database, stores files in the storage. Uh, there's automated processing where um, it's, um, it's looking for information in the database, get the files from storage, um, uh, process runs and generates outputs. Outputs go back to, uh, to the landing zone where it gets ingested into the system. This distribution component distributes data to the users and upload components to, uh, to upload data on, on the system. 
So this is the next level uh, looking in the um, architecture. Um, highlighted component here is ingest. On the right, we have automated processing components. On the top, we have distribution components. And the bottom left is uh, upload components. So let's talk about this diagram a little bit. Um, the blue squared boxes are OODT components that we are using. And the mauve uh, pur purplish components are the components that we plan to develop. So uh, we get uh, data from, um, from data sources. Um, we pull data via push-pull uh, component, and we put data on our landing zone. Um, then we also have data sources that push data to our landing zone. Uh, we have crawlers uh, that basically look for new files uh, appearing on the landing zone. It gives that information, file information, to file manager, uh, another component of ODT. File information is basically your data type, file name, your location where uh, it resides on the landing zone to the file manager. Uh, file manager then reads that file. Um, it gets the metadata information, puts that in the database, and uh, on successful um, addition of that information to the database, it communicates with crawler. Crawler then archives that file into the storage. So that's kind of the ingest process. Uh, for automated processing, uh, workflow manager uh, consists of multiple workflows, each workflow being a PGE uh, task. So um, for each PGE task, we have a bunch of preconditions that are required to be fulfilled before a task can execute. So those preconditions are um, available in the planner. So planner is responsible for checking the preconditions have met or not. And if they are met, then, um, then workflow manager basically sends the task to the resource manager, and resource manager figures out where that task is uh, going to execute, which server is going to execute on. So uh, once the task executes, uh, it generates outputs, and outputs go back onto the landing zone for, uh, for ingestion. Um, we have distribution component here, which is, again, going to uh, distribute data to the users. Uh, incinerator is responsible for cleanup of, uh, <laughs> uh, of data from our inventory. Um, and upload component here is responsible uh, for letting users uh, upload data onto our system for collaboration. So let's talk about ingest, compo uh, ingest components a little bit. So uh, on the left here, these are the examples of data sources for pull and push. Um, basically, we um, pull, we're planning to pull the data from these data sources and put it in the landing zone. Uh, for each data source, um, we're planning to have a directory specified in the landing zone, and same thing for um, pushes. Um, crawler is here um, responsible for verifying the checksum. Uh, for the file that is um, available on the landing zone also. Um, once the checksum is verified, it again sends the information to file manager. File manager, uh, based on the data type, it uses the appropriate extractor. Uh, in our case, it would be a, either generic extractor um, or H5 extractor. Um, and then uh, once it parses off the metadata, puts it in the database, then uh, it sends the information to crawler, and again, crawler would, is responsible for archive the file file in the storage. For distribution, uh, we're planning to build a website uh, for, for users to be able to search on the metadata parameters, uh, to subscribe to uh, data sets that they are interested in, and uh, be able to download data sets. So uh, there's a lot more detail to it, but this is pretty high level. Uh, they would be able to ad hoc download data, or if they want multiple files, they'd be able to do wgets, and we would provide them a way to uh, download multiple files that way. For subscription, we would have a subscription service running, uh, which would run every couple of minutes or so, and it would provide uh, links to in the staging area for the users where user can come in and pull the data uh, from. For uploads, um, users would be able to either, uh, you know, list the existing types available in our inventory. They can add to that, uh, add data to an existing type or create their own uh, data type, specify the files that they want to upload, 
and the expiration time and uh, you know, a retention time basically of how long they want to keep the data. Uh, once they provide those things, we generate an XML file and we move that information to the landing zone. And then once the data is there, um, then we ingest it via a normal process. So uh, Wayne McCullough is gonna talk about automated processing and database and performance. As Peyush mentioned, what we're, it, our automated processing system is kind of fits in here, uh, interacts with our inventory and uses the resource manager and a workflow manager. Um, we're executing these PGEs. Uh, what we have, what we're planning to do here is we have a planner component, which is custom code, which will go through the inventory pull out conditions and identify um, whether or not we have enough data. The conditions can be pretty much anything that uh, interacts with our uh, metadata, location information, product types, et cetera. You know, if the users wanted to know, get a continuous segment of data over New Zealand that doesn't have clouds, they could uh, generate uh, that. Then pretty much our workflow is uh, standard ODT workflow. Um, we stage all the files that the PGE needs, and then we run these tasks uh, of the PGE uh, going through the workflow. Where you're gonna use the resource manager to um, ba basically assign where the, each of those tasks runs and um, uh, manage the, our multiple servers. Once the PGE is done, hopefully it uh, generates some data and that just uh, lands into our landing zones uh, for uh, ingest. We're gonna be using the resource manager on multiple servers here, um, multiple nodes per server to distribute the problem as much as we can um, across our servers. But our resource manager, uh, we're planning to be pretty much out of the box for OODT. OODT. Um, the incinerator, um, again, this just deletes files, but we're gonna be using the workflow for, uh, to manage that. We're going to be having our own database to deal with our um, mission-specific metadata. Um, we're just using a standard Postgres database. We're using the PostGIS extension to the uh, Postgres database. Um, and we're using the Hibernate uh, layer on top of everything to interface with the database. Pretty standard stuff. Um, at the highest level, every uh, data file in our system, be it our standard science data or um, custom uh, user data, calibration data, is going to have a record at the highest level and we're going to store additional metadata and tables underneath it. Um, all the information we need to run subscriptions um, is going to be stored in a database. Um, all the information we need to run the PGEs, you know, uh, the conditions that trigger the PGE, whether or not the PGE has actually been run yet uh, is all going to be stored in our database. Um, we're also going to be collecting some custom statistics as we go through to allow the developers and the operators and management to figure out how we're actually doing to see if we're falling behind on our uh, operations or if we're actually uh, running correctly. And, uh, that's all going to be going into our database. Let's talk a little bit about our performance. Um, when we went through PDR, we got a lot of questions from the community. You know, the Goddard community wasn't familiar with OODT and they wanted to know, is this going to work? You know, how do you know this is going to work and you're not going to fall behind? Um, we had a small test set up um, using some of the hardware that um, we're going to be using uh, once we actually go to deployment. Um, you know, a pretty nice blade. Um, we're using GPFS storage uh, across the board here, um, but it was, uh, we set up a GPS uh, on a single uh, SAN. So um, when we go to full deployment, there'll be multiple SANs serving out the GPFS. We have software, 
you know, pretty much a standard build out. So when we got, went into our performance testing, um, a lot of what we're trying to do here is break down what we need to do, make sure that um, we can do everything we have, have to do here without um, falling behind. We wanted to verify our ingest, our inventory, our PGEs, and our distribution performance as much as we could without actually coding everything along the way. So I'm gonna start off with our ingest tasks. Um, what do we need to do for our ingest is, first of all, we have to detect the file ha has landed. Um, we need to verify that the file um, meets our integrity standards, um, extract the metadata from the file, store the, fi uh, the information about this file into our database, <coughs> and archive the file. Now, our key standard here is 102 minutes. That's how long it takes the satellite to go around the Earth. And so we had one orbit of test data based off of our previous system. And we needed to make sure that um, we could do everything with it under 102 minutes. So let's start talking about our performance for um, our HDF dump and our checksum verification. Now, we store all of our data files or the, uh, that are coming in are HDF. Um, it's hierarchical di data file, um, widely used standard in the NASA community. Um, so we had to make sure that we could actually pull out, uh, out all the metadata off that. We found out that um, a single HDF uh, dump is not I.O. bound, but when it's, we start throwing more threads at it, it um, becomes I.O. bound, which is where we want to be. Um, metadata, we see diminishing returns um, at a much quicker, uh, excuse me, the, that's the uh, checksum. We see diminishing returns because the checksum has to hit every byte of the file. Um, so we get about, uh, you know, worst case performance, about 8.6 files per second, um, 23 minutes to do an entire orbit for just the, um, the HDF dump and the metadata. And if we start abusing threads, and this is all working on one computer here, we get uh, almost 20 files per second. Um, then we have the database side. Uh, we, haven't really spent a lot of time yet tweaking our database performance, but this is where we are, we're at our um, performance testing. For what it took to do an entire orbit's worth of inserts, it was under a minute, updates for under a minute. Um, so total per orbit estimated on what we needed, we're looking at about two minutes and 34 seconds of a process just waiting for the database to do what the database does. Um, so when we start adding it all, all together, it took us about half a minute to detect the files that are there, uh, almost eight minutes to verify that the file, uh, that it passed checksum, um, about 2.7 minutes uh, for the, um, extracting the metadata. And um, then we uh, about 1.85 minutes to uh, store it in the database. And we get to grand total adding everything up without writing a single process to do this. Each piecewise, it took us about 13.2 minutes per orbit. So what, you know, all about an eight to one ratio, which is good. It's uh, kind of where we want to be. So let's put it in o OVT. Uh, this chart kind of explains where we were with our performance testing. Now this red line at the top here, this is one orbit. That's how long it takes uh, the spacecraft to go around uh, the Earth. If we can't get better than this red line, we might as well pack up and go home. Our requirement, NASA is very big on requirements, is five terabytes a day. It's a fairly it's a conservative requirement. And this purple line is where we did, uh, got to with just our standalone tasks. And 
so we started uh, taking multiple file managers and crawlers uh, at this. These are uh, just basic OODT components. We had um, some custom Java code plugged into the um, file manager to extract our metadata. And you know, as we expected, we started adding more file managers, we got better performance. And we got uh, to our level of diminishing returns at about uh, seven file managers, working at about a ratio of one crawler per one file manager operation here. Um, this is good. Uh, so we're actually, uh, uh, we think we can meet the data. And this is operating on one machine, and we have several machines there to actually tackle the problem. Um, but it looks like we have a little bit of work to do with in terms of configuration here to, to meet our standalone uh, tasks. We expect a little bit of penalty, but uh, we'd like to be a little bit better. We have a lot to learn about the OODT. So PGE performance. Um, to our user community, what the really big deal is is comparing what the system was to what the system will be. The green bar is what the system was, our version two of the software without ODT. Older hardware, um, uh, it, they run slower. When we run it with, um, on the new hardware, we get this blue bar. And then when we run it with OODT on our new hardware, we're getting this red bar. We're gonna see it's slightly better. Now, the, our current theory as to why it's running faster under OODT is we were running it without um, sending, uh, we're sending the log to the uh, console in the blue bar and OODT sends it correctly to a file and consoles are slow if you are pinging lots and lots of data. Uh, we also wanted to see how it would work running multiple PGEs against the, um, uh, on the same hardware against uh, the system. And so what we did is we ran it on the old system and we again ran it on the new system. Now um, running about four machines, we're, don't, we're not quite seeing the same two to one ratio here that we saw, uh, saw on the previous chart. And what the red bar represents is when we're running for uh, four different PGEs, this is the slowest one. Some of them operate much faster than others. But we're still seeing better performance here. Um, we don't have a distribution system yet. So about all we can really do uh, for our distribution system is effectively assert we think it will be okay because we've analyzed the pieces along the way. We know how long it costs to do a search. We know how long it uh, costs to create links. We know how long, uh, how fast our system roughly is to read the files because a checksum is effectively going to do the exact same thing as it does to copy out all the data. So we think that we can meet our distribution uh, requirements for the user community, but we're not going to be absolutely certain about that until we build the system out. So in conclusion, we think OODT will work. We think we will get the performance we need. Um, we think we can get our ingest system uh, working fast enough so that uh, we can catch up because there's going to be downtime and occasionally the user community, the data doesn't always just trickle in. Occasionally we get hit with a flood of data and we want to catch up as quickly as possible. So thank you very much. So, uh, is there any questions? So um, in terms of uh, performance of the file manager, um, you just showed that uh, to get uh, acceptable performance, you had to go to a system of six or seven file managers there. Yes. So um, is that due because is that uh, due to the ingest phase or the metadata query phase? Do you know what's uh, your bottleneck there? Um, your ingest performance 
if you're doing it right, should be I.O. bound, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, what we think uh, is going on here, why a single file manager isn't doing it, is you're running into various systematic delays. You read, you read, let me go back a few slides here to the HDF performance. Why is the HDF performance get much better the more I throw uh, at it? Because there's certain delays uh, systematic to opening up a file and parsing, uh, loading up the HDF dump program and parsing all the HDF tables. It's not purely I.O. bound if you're running just one, one of them. So you have to parallelize the problem to, uh, to an extent to get the most performance out of it. Okay, so it's in jest. That's what you're, what you're saying, really. It's a, it, you, you get a bottleneck, you, you get the delays when you ingest the products, not when you query them back, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, the, the only thing I wanted to mention is that you know the file manager can run with different backends. I assume you're probably going running with the out-of-the-box Lucene implementation, which is you know, fine. Mm -hmm. um, other possibility would include you know the relational database in the backend. Uh, and another thing that's coming up the pipeline, and you know, both Andrew and me are going to talk about that, uh, is uh, we're, going to th we're thinking about the solar implementation, which is going to be much, much faster in terms of querying the metadata of the system, although it's not going to help you in parsing the metadata and ingesting that in. But no, that's the other thing you can do. I mean, you can experiment with different ODT, different backends with ODT file manager, and see if that helps in any way your performance. Although mm -hmm. you know, you're still okay, but that's something yeah. you can try. Okay, uh, thank you. Sure. Hey, guys. So I, had, I wrote my questions on my laptop, so I didn't forget them. Yeah, so good job. Um, I, so you guys said you're using Hibernate, or you're mm -hmm. going to use Hibernate eventually. Does it support the spatial queries for Postgres, or are you going to have to do something special there? That's a good question. Um, right now, in a pure Cartesian mapping of coordinates, it seems to work. In a spherically corrected, uh, uh, a coordinate system, uh, we think we may have to do something special. Okay. Um, we're not, you know, we, I get the impression that it isn't completely there yet. And I think it's not so much the problem with Hibernate, but actually the mappings of the post gist extensions into JDBC. Yep. Um, and that's, we've seen some documentation about some solutions to it, but uh, we don't quite, we haven't quite decided how we're going to get around them yet. One option that I, I was, I, I, I thought about was on Project we're using is that we, we dump, it creates something else to dump into, but if you have a specific interface that you're just going to do like gis -E stuff, you could always dump it into GeoServer, uh, you know, <laughs> and then using GDAL or whatever and, and translate like some of your data products to specialized things you put in GeoServer and it provides like a WMS endpoint that you might be able to build stuff off of if you're building apps or whatever you're having people do with that data. Anyways, we could talk about that more. Sorry, one more question. Sure. Even though there's plenty of time. Uh, the, so, so you guys are collecting stats, or you're gonna collect stats, you know, for the use of for operators, you said, and, and whatever. That is awesome. That's like another big data thing or, or whatever that I mean, I don't even know, maybe you guys know how you're gonna use it, or maybe you don't. But um exactly how you're going to use it, but I imagine you could mine some of those stats uh, on what's going on in the system or whatever to then maybe suggest or develop new and interesting ODT things or, or other things depending on like what you're tracking. So you could probably help the operators, but even help the system too maybe. Well, I can uh, kind of explain a little bit of what we're do uh, doing with stats um, since we have a few minutes to talk here. That'd be great. Um, a, on our previous system, statistics were used essentially as a monitoring system. Um, if we suddenly see the, the number of files being processed in a, a period of time, uh, the operators would say, oh, we, there's something going wrong here. You know, if the PGEs are not getting run, there's something going wrong here. So it's, it's in many ways, the statistics and the status of the system in the user community is tightly in, uh, connected. So, you know, the idea is, is you know, we, ha we should see a certain flow of data going on, especially, and also we have many different data types. And so if we can br uh, show on a chart, we're receiving this amount of data and we see a sudden spike going up or down, a human can look at that and identify there might be a problem 
faster than we can code something to always identify problems when they come in. I mean, it's, you that, know. That, that makes total sense. So like, it's almost, it's almost like both collection for the ops team, but also action from that, you yes. know, automatically or whatever. So, so ODT provides some basic collection things, but not great. Like we have a PCS package that provides some health monitoring and some other stuff, mm -hmm. but it could definitely be extended. And a lot of times what we do to extend it is we just deploy gl ganglia or something and use that in concert, you know, with some of the other stuff. Ganglia, this, you know, distributed resource monitoring system and yada yada mm -hmm. developed by Matt Massey. Anyways, if you guys do something cool there, I think that would be another thing when you guys eventually get to contributing back to ODT, not just like if you do something cooler with the way you collect statistics or so something to augment even like what we're doing would be awesome, but also like your action framework or whatever that you're doing post that. Like if you codified that as a set of, I don't know, crawler actions or workflow tests or whatever, or even if you codified it in a different way and we could somehow learn from that, that would be cool. I mean, at the moment, it'll probably be codified more as TOs, t uh, basically human interactions, not a programmatic interaction. Um, it's a lot easier to say, uh, to raise a red flag and say, uh, tell a human there might be a problem than it is to come up with a programmatic solution, at Understood. least in this phase of our development. Okay, so. Thank thanks guys. Okay, I think I'm gonna add one more. Uh, I was very interested, it was good. I would like to get the statistics, uh, particularly on, mm -hmm. on your application. If I just step back and look at it, you had a new problem. You said ODT was promising, you're gonna apply ODT. So I'd just like to get the bottom line of, were the set of components, the ODT components, generally useful for you, or did you find uh, they covered the problem, or that you had to add other ones, or there, were there some that, that you thought uh, were, were not that useful? Because you, you, you talked in ports here about what ODT was doing, and then by implication, there were parts that ODT was not addressing. So I think he picked the right slide here. So um, we have these components. You know, we decided to use these components for the features that were advertised for these components, mm -hmm. right? And we did a quick prototyping, and they kind of worked. Um, one thing that we knew from our other projects that Postgres database uh, would serve our needs because you know other other projects are using it and it would be able to. I think ODT uh, by default uses Lucene database, uh, Lucene file system, which uh, which we weren't sure and we knew that Postgres would work, so we kind of went in that direction. Um, and we we want to be able we wanted to be able to do queries and all those type of things, which not sure how much Lucene supports. Uh, so that's the reason we went in that direction and. Um, and for and even for distribution and for automated processing, automated processing, we um, we decided to um, build this planner module to so that we can automatically kick off processes based on availability of uh, of certain files. You know those preconditions that we talked mm -hmm. about. Um, not sure if ODT has that uh, built in. Uh, maybe Chris would be able to correct me. Uh, so so that's that's why we decided to implement planner. But for most parts, you know, crawler, file manager, workflow resource, we, we uh, and push pull, we have been able to use them without modification. I think a lot of people do what you guys just did with your planner, in the sense that you know, like some people may use like the workflow manager or whatever and try and codify everything inside of that and have CD, and then other people like there are just certain things that they pull out into a various other component that then they just stuck to that. Like on OCO, we had this thing where like we to really decide on the level three pipeline when it should run. Right. We pulled it out into a separate daemon and it looked up like every few minutes and then said, is everything ready? Is that about? And then if so, stage stuff for the workflow manager. That's kind of exactly what we are doing in Planner. Uh, you describe Planner. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, that's good. I think this chart uh, captures it pretty well if you read it carefully. Thanks. Okay. And all this stuff's going to be on the ODT wiki, right? <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions?